Hi, I'm Robin Block, the CEO of Creative EC and the creator of In Search of Darkness and In Search of Tomorrow. And I'm very delighted to be on The Graveyard Show. Welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. I am your caretaker, and the graveyard is open. Well, if you're a regular listener of the program, you know how much of a fan I am of the In Search of Darkness documentaries. Um, I've had director David Weiner on the show uh, several times to talk about the films, and I also had musicians Jamie Chambers and Don McLennan Jr., otherwise known as Weary Pines, on the program as well to talk about composing and uh, performing the music for those films. Uh, so it only made sense to have the creator and the producer of the series, Robin Block, on the program. He is the man you heard at the top of the show. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, the In Search of Darkness uh, films, uh, especially the upcoming final film in the trilogy, In Search of Darkness Part 3, as well as uh, we'll get into a little bit of the 1980s sci-fi documentary, In Search of Tomorrow, which will be coming out in February of 2022. Stay tuned after the interview. Uh, I'm going to tell you how you can reserve a copy of In Search of Darkness 3, as well as all the different crowdfunding tier levels uh, for uh, all the backers of the film. And I'll also get into the perks uh, you'll get with each one of those tiers. Now, what's important about this crowdfunding is that uh, if you are interested and you're listening to this as the uh, podcast is being dropped, uh, you need to jump on it now because as of midnight Halloween, the offer will go away. So if you're listening to this in November and December, uh, you more than likely you've missed out on this offer. So um, so if you're listening to it in October, uh, definitely jump on this if you are interested. And again, I'll get into that on the other side of the interview, what you will get at the different uh, pay level tiers. Uh, very quickly, uh, if you'd like to follow the show on Slasher, uh, you can do so at Graveyard Show Podcast is the handle. At Graveyard Show Podcast is how you can follow this show on the Slasher app. And, uh, well, if you are uh, just uh, like to do it the old-fashioned way and you would like to send emails, you can do that here, too. Uh, gyspodcast at gmail.com. Gyspodcast at gmail.com is how you can email the show, uh, send me your thoughts, comments. Uh, and if you're part of the horror community, even if you're uh, following the show on Slasher and you have something to promote, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out as well. Uh, later in the show, I'm going to uh, give you some information regarding the latest GYS Classic podcast upload and what you can expect uh, down the road for future uploads. And I'm also going to talk about uh, some details regarding the final show of the year. Yes, already looking ahead to the final show of the year. Uh, I have some details and what you can expect for that as well. It's going to be different from what I've done previously. But again, I'll get into that later in the program. Because as you hear in the background, a new grave is being added. And when that happens, my guest is here and it's time for me to get to work. Joining me now from the UK is Robin Block, who is the creator and producer of the In Search of Darkness series, uh, as well as the upcoming uh, 80s sci-fi doc In Search of Tomorrow, which we'll touch on as well. Uh, Robin is also the founder and CEO of Creator VC, which is a, a company that focuses on community-powered entertainment. Uh, it's a real pleasure welcoming Robin to the graveyard. Robin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me on board. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here. Well, it's great having you here. Um, I'm such a fan of the series. Um, and uh, I've had David and I had Weary Pines on the program. Um, I just can't get enough of this series. So I'm really looking forward to part three. I was excited to hear about part three. So let's talk about part three. <laughs> um, so um, the first In Search of Darkness film sort of laid out the foundation for 80s horror. Uh, part two comes out and it starts discussing uh, more films outside of the United States, more international films. Um, so talk about what this third edition is going to be about. Yeah, well, I've got to say, you know, a third edition was never uh, planned, uh, nor, was a, nor was a direct sequel. 
Um, but the response to In Search of Darkness Part 2 was phenomenal. It was a very, very successful project. And, um, you know, I think David Weiner, our director, did a phenomenal job on that. But our audience wanted more and they made it very clear to us they wanted more. And so it became a challenge um, to figure out how can we, you know, maintain um, the quality of the series and give them more. And so, uh, you know, we, we had covered, you know, all the classics, um, some of the classic international movies as well, but there's this whole fantastic underbelly of 80s horror, which the way I put it is like the bottom shelf of the horror section <laughs> of your VHS store, which, which is the real fun stuff. And what you're noticing now, especially on uh, platforms like YouTube, is where there's a reverence for these kind of hidden gems. Um, and they're being looked upon in a new light. And this is the really kind of batshit crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, straight to video where you didn't have, it was no rules, rules. Um, and, you know, the, the experience of when you, you know, your selection was based on either word of mouth or how insane the cover art was. And I love that. And I have very, very fond memories of going to the video store with my mum and, and picking up movies that just had the most insane covers. And now you look back on that with real nostalgia, but you also see how much creativity and talent went into positioning those movies. And also there was no rules in them. So the, the, the filmmakers um, had uh, a lot more freedom. They were often uh, working with lower budgets. Um, so in a weird way, they had a bit more freedom because they weren't, they, there wasn't so much on the line for each of these pictures. And um, we've built up a, a considerable audience now. And we know that there's real affection for um, the, the underbelly, the hidden treasure of 80s horror. And that's what we, we want to investigate. That's what we want to elevate. Um, and I really think part three is going to be the most fun. Um, you know, everything about this project so far has been real fun, especially the interaction with our audience. So, um, yeah, I'm just loving it. Speaking of the underbelly of the video store, um, back in the, uh, back in the eighties, um, and I believe, yeah, yeah, maybe late seventies, um, you had the video nasties in the UK. Um, how much did that affect your viewing? Uh, in terms of being able to have access to films it was huge it was huge you know I, I i was born in 77 so the whole video nasty stuff was happening um you know when i was old enough to understand there was things i wasn't allowed to watch like i remember i remember being aware uh, of this happening and it carried on for years afterwards as well so um movies were more than movies they became urban legends you know you'd have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of <laughs> yeah um, you know, like the, the evil dead where you could you know pretty much not make out anything and it, it, there was lots of events and a lot of hysteria in the uk around this and in a way um i think that's part of the mythos behind the video nasties and and it, it kind of elevated the work um, so it was it was something that we really you know if you grew up in the eighties in the UK, you were aware of it, um, and and um, it was a great time to sort of as a child start getting into horror. I remember me and my friends, you know, um, one of, one of my school friends, a guy called Craig, his dad ran a video shop, so he would always come into school with like the latest movie that was obviously eighteen rated, and we would have been about twelve. Um, and we sort of, you know, try and get a copy and, and, and sit down and watch it. And we all gather together. And, you know, I have incredibly fond memories of that. And, uh, you know, that, that's all part of it. Um, it's funny because sometimes you revisit these films as, a, as an adult. And they don't have, they don't make you feel the same way. But oftentimes they still do. And I think, and I think that from a UK perspective, all of that is, it, it you know, it's in the air. It's part of the experience we we had. A lot of movies from the US came over to the UK with different titles, with different cover art. 
um, you know, I was very fortunate with the first In Search of Darkness to work with the artist and illustrator Graham Humphreys, whose work really informed a whole generation of horror moviegoers. Um, you know, his work, his signature um, on, on, on films like Evil Dead and Nightmare on Elm Street and, and, and stuff like that. So it was a very different experience over here for the, for the video nasties. But ultimately, I think it's gone to help create a mythos around this time in history, which is perfect to revisit now. Well, obviously, um, one of the great imports from the UK to the United States uh, for movies is um, Hammer. Um, certainly one of the great studios um, that has had so much influence here in the United States. I, I remember as a kid growing up seeing these Hammer movies and just falling in love with them. Um, and then you had, uh, had Amicus that came out later uh, sort of as their competitor and they pulled some of their stars uh, like Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing to come and do some of their anthology films. Um, I'm wondering in the UK, how big and how popular was Hammer as a young boy uh, watching those films? And um, how much of an impact did that have on you as well? Yeah, so I have very fond memories of watching Hammer horror movies on and they were they used to be played late night on bbc one and uh, i convinced my parents to to um record them for me and they were brilliant i mean i i've revisited some some uh, hammer horror movies recently actually and um, because it's been years and years since i watched them and they're just so um they're just so quaint <laughs> you know everything the cinematography the costume design the performances it just there's something very safe about them you know they're not frightening they're yeah. incredibly yeah. comforting films but they're iconic um that they you know you can see a hammer horror movie a mile away um they're yeah i mean and, and a huge influence but what's really smart about the hammer horror stuff is obviously we're looking at 60s and 70s but there's such a juxtaposition between that and say the video nasties it's yeah. like it's gone up into the leagues or that, and then like American New Wave cinema that's come over and been very visceral. Um, and so, you know, they, from our viewpoint now, and you know, I, I was I was exposed to Hammer Horror when I was a child, and they were they were intriguing, and there was something about it that you know I knew I shouldn't be watching, but they weren't, you know, they didn't traumatize me. You know, I remember watching as a kid watching American Werewolf in London, and and being frightened to look in the mirror. <laughs> for three months afterwards so so like you know i i know what it like i know what it feels like to be traumatized by a movie i kind of miss that as an adult like i think a movie has to really try hard to traumatize me now um but there's something very you know there's a there's, a, there's a still a legacy and a strong affection for hammer horror not just in the uk but worldwide um and uh you know it's it's definitely got its place in fact when we do a 70s version of In Search of Darkness, we will be covering uh, Hammer Horror and we'll be looking at it from a modern, you know, contemporary perspective. We'll be revisiting some of those iconic titles and looking at them through the lens of, of where we are now in the world. Wait, did you just say a 70s version of In Search of Darkness? A 70s one, so yeah. So, you know, I've been... Um, once In Search of Darkness 3 is um, kind of finished production and we go into post which will happen probably around april next year um then we go straight into developing 70s and 90s wow uh, from yeah so we want to we, we want to sort of work on them concurrently they'll both come out at different times but 70s i don't want to sort of veer too far off the the subject matter but you think about the 70s as a decade of cinema and it's incredibly rich and so different to 80s in the aesthetic the feel the audience our approach is going to have to be different as well because a lot of the talent is no longer with us from that era because you're going back sort of 50 years now um but yeah like there's we, we listen to our audience and it's really split you know in terms of what i think would be the most commercial project it would be 90s i think 90s is, is right we've obviously got the um the 90s um franchises are being revisited we've got the new screen coming out um but yeah there's there's a lot there's a lot to revisit there there's a lot of gems to uncover and um i, I think our audience will really will really like it 
Oh, I can't wait. I want to see these already. <laughs> um, well, that's that's really awesome. And uh, I know everybody listening right now is going to be really thrilled and excited and will be following very closely. Um, speaking of closely, um, you've been working closely with uh, director David Weiner and uh, the man who I don't mention enough on this program, uh, your editor, uh, Samuel Way. Uh, you've been working with them now on the trilogy of In Search of Darkness as well as In Search of Tomorrow. Uh, talk about that relationship how and how it's grown over these films, uh, what it's like working uh, together at this point now. Uh, I, would, I would assume that there's uh, sort of a shorthand and sort of a way that you can communicate with each other about what needs to happen or what you'd like without having to really kind of get too involved. Yeah, there is. I mean, um, I'd worked with Sam before I started Creative EC. So I've always run media companies and I knew Sam. Um, and, um, you know, he was someone that originally came to my attention because I got sent a bunch of show reels from editors. And I liked his because his showed rhythm. He understood timing. And that was always something I really looked for. Um, so we started working together in like, I think 2016. Um, and, uh, when I started putting together in search of darkness, he was actually the first editor that I went to see. And I said, look, I really want you to work on this with me, David. Um, I'd already done the first Kickstarter for in search of darkness and I didn't have a director. Um, I hadn't decided on a director, um, until afterwards and I'd put together this advisor circle and it was a WhatsApp group. And as you know, I knew In Search of Darkness was gonna be, I knew it was gonna go somewhere because I remember editing with my good friend and a guy called Paul Conshake who does our motion graphics um, on all our projects. Um, him and I collaborated on a sort of 90 second um, kind of teaser trailer um to get the vibe right and we pushed it out on twitter and it just went viral and we had like neil gaiman retweeting it and people like just off this and it just opened up the door so i knew conceptually and from an aesthetic point of view that we had something which which was worth pursuing um and so part of my process especially when i go into a new area because the first in search of darkness was the first time i sort of entered the, the the horror industry um and uh, my good friend jessica dwyer who was a a producer on uh, the first in search of darkness um she was part of this group and she said oh you must meet david he's just brilliant he's a lovely guy and he was in this group with me and the thing about having a kind of informal kind of group on a, on whatsapp or slack or something like that is that the cream rises to the top. The people that really want to be there eventually make themselves known. Um, and David was that, he, he was super helpful, um, you, know, you know, really encouraging, knew his stuff and was a great guy. And then um, I sat down with him and I said, look, this is my vision for In Search of Darkness. This is what I want to uh, do with it. Um, this is how I want to approach it. And he came back to me with a kind of proposal based on what we discussed. And I was like, yep, this is what I want. You're on, let's make it happen. Um, and, and I suppose the rest is history. And now we're doing part three, which is something I couldn't have conceived of. Now, David's fantastic. Um, you know, real attention to detail. Um, you know, great to work with. Um, and, you know, I think now with part three uh you know like you like you sort of alluded to earlier we all give each other space to work you know the art of leadership is really you know finding someone who wants to do the thing you want them to do um and and david is built for this stuff and um you know he he kind of earned his spot with in search of darkness you know in search of darkness too was very much his vision with that um and uh you know i brought him on to in search of tomorrow which um was uh, for quite a while the highest grossing crowdfunded documentary ever uh, we just got surpassed a couple of weeks ago by by one on on ethereum um but 
uh, you know, that is looking amazing. That's actually our biggest project we've ever done. We've, we've got 11,000 backers for that. So that's wow. going to be huge. Um, and it's, you know, it's David's opus. I mean, he's feeling it right now because that's a, a lot of pressure, but he's also very seasoned. And so with Sam, my editor, um, you know, we've, we, we've kind of built this together um, and we have a workflow and we do use shorthand. I mean, these projects are very stressful. Um, and I like working with, with small teams because a small team that's motivated can outwork and outmaneuver any large team any day of the week. And I really think um, having the right team, having the right focus and leadership is, is the reason that we've been successful. I would you agree know, with I never that. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely so, hate that. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, because you you the, you work so well together, and this is from someone who's you know just watching the movies. But I could just tell by the production value and the quality of everything as it's coming in. Um, just seeing, it's it's there. Like I'm watching these movies, and I'm like, everything they're doing is there on screen. The interviews are there. The editing's there. The graphics are there. The music's there. It, it's the content is there, and I think that says a lot about all of you as a, as that small team because it's true it's like you're all motivated you're all great at what you do and now you're just going ahead and doing it and it'll come out on the other end and you know i'm sure you know it is stressful because i look at i mean when i look at these these films i look at it and i go my gosh if i'm seeing robert england for 20 minutes on this four-hour movie how much interview time you know did they have with him six hours eight hours four hours yeah that's a three-hour interview wow man <laughs> right i mean david doesn't do short interviews he's very detailed focused and um there's so much i mean we, we have hundreds and hundreds of hours i mean we could do we could go on to part seven. I was going to say, you could probably do 10 to. movies easily on these. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. I, I, want, I, want to, I want to go out on a high. I mean, with part three, I, I feel that, um, and it's been vindicated because we, you know, we're a week into crowdfunding for part three um, at the time of recording. And what's really significant about how we've approached it this time is that we're not on Kickstarter, we're not on Indiegogo. I've built a crowdfunding platform for our audience. And, um, you know, we've raised, you know, $200,000 in the first week of a 25 day campaign. Wow. And, 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 and that shows me that the proposition, how we're speaking to our backers aligns, like they, they are eager to see what we're doing. And it's hard because, uh, part, part one, um, you know, blew all my expectations. It took me to Hollywood. We had a Hollywood premiere, like it was amazing. It was the most amazing journey. Part two, in many ways, is a superior film because I think as a team, we'd all bedded in. Um, and I, and I, I love part two. Um, I, I just think it's a really engaging piece of work that just flies by. Um, so part three represented a challenge because I was very much of the mindset, we're only going to do it if, if we can nail it, if this can be like the horror trilogy you know um and and that all starts with the concept so you know the two things that we're really pushing is one this is the underbelly of 80s horror and two this is you know our backers we just care about you we don't care about anybody else like you choose tell us what you want us to feature this time what hidden treasure can we uncover together you know, one of the things that happened with this journey, and it's not something I intended, it was just something that happened, that we've observed, is that people use the In Search of Darkness films almost as an extended watch list. You know, it kind of allows them to discover movies they may not have necessarily seen, and it primes them to look at them in a new light, because um, you know, it's what I call the three Cs. Like the, 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 the kind of formula to what we do is, the three C's. So it's curation. You know, what movies are we going to feature? What are we going to talk about? Commentary is a second C. Like our role is to bring the best speakers in the world together to talk about this stuff. And the final C is the most important, especially as a crowdfunded entity. It's community. It's like, how can we build an intimate and a more intimate relationship with our audience? How can we scale intimacy? And that's what part three is all about. Like we want people to 
we want to listen to our audience. They know what they want us to cover. They're, they're, they're in on it with us. And, you know, for the last few months, we've been putting up posts going, what do you want to see? And it's been, it's been, you know, they've, they've, they've been our most liked post, our most engaged post. There is a need for this. Um, and, and that vehicle is part three. So I think part three is going to be the most fun, not just to make, but to watch. Um, you've you've kind of hit on a bunch of stuff that I wanted to talk to you about already, so this is great. Um, this this really kind of helps me bounce around a little bit. Um, you talked about crowdfunding uh, the, the films. Um, at what point did you come up with the idea to crowdfund these films? What what was the motivation behind that? And and how much work actually goes into doing something like that? Because I know for some people, it's out there, that are out there like ah, I want to make a movie, I'll just crowdfund it. And I know it's more than that. So if you could get into that a little bit, I, I, that would be awesome. I get tapped up for advice all the time, right? And um, crowdfunding is a full contact sport. You need planning. You need, you know, high capability execution. Like I'm, I'm sitting at my computer desk. I've got two massive monitors, and one of them is like my Trello board for In Search of Darkness 3 and the amount of content we're creating, the amount of thinking and strategy and partnerships that have gone into being able to raise the kind of money we're raising to make this stuff happen. It's complex. Um, and But what's amazing about crowdfunding is you don't have to answer to anybody else apart from your backers. And as an independent creator, and I'm very proud to be independent, I don't want to answer to anybody apart from my backers. That's who we're ultimately beholden to. And, and it's, it's a meritocracy. There's nobody there saying, well, that's your budget. That's all you're worth. Now, if we get this right, it's uncapped. Um, and you get what you deserve in the realm of crowdfunding. And that's hugely, hugely liberating. Also, it's very frightening because if you don't do well, you can't blame anybody else. It's down to you. I think people approach crowdfunding that just don't necessarily, the, the, the crowdfunding campaigns that don't do well or fail completely are ones where they've approached it with a lack of understanding of how marketing works. And I see that happen all the time. Um, I, you know, we, we, to, we usually spend at least three months before launch putting stuff together, putting promos together, bringing the right partners on board. Um, and that was certainly uh, what I did with the first In Search of Darkness. I spent a lot of time just getting the groundwork in place. So when we launch, it's not a surprise. You know, you, what you want to be doing is when you launch a project that, that there's anticipation for it. Um, and, uh, you know, when it works, it's the most amazing thing because I don't need a distributor. I don't need to play the filmmaking game. Um, and I don't need to get exploited either. You know, like it's a direct relationship with our audience. Our audience are co-creators with us. So we have to create something which they will buy into. Otherwise, these projects don't happen. And, and when you get that, when you see a successful campaign and you execute on a, on a successful campaign, it's, the, it's one of the most exhilarating feelings I've ever had. I have to say, what you've just described to me takes me back to when um, I first uh, was interested in entertainment. And you are the def the modern day definition of what the independent producer was, or even maybe the Hollywood producer was back in the early days of filmmaking, which is like, you find a project, you develop a project, you put it together, and you're doing what a producer does. You're, you're taking it from seed and you're watching it grow into whatever it is, you know, a plant or a vegetable or whatever it is. Um, but you're, you're taking this and you're, and you're behind it 100%. I think nowadays we see a lot of things because of the sausage factory that entertainment has become. Um, it's like, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. So, you know, there's that. Um, but in your case, you know, this is a project that you created that you came up with and you wanted to do and you came up with a plan and you uh, formulated an amazing foundation and now you're executing that. So if correct me if I'm wrong, I see this as you get up in the morning, 
you you know fire up the coffee or tea you're you're in front of your computer you're 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 doing whatever research or whatever it is that you're you know doing in the mornings and then you're like on the phones on email on social media you know going all day networking calling and i'm sure that's going all day and probably well into the night as well is that would that be something that would be kind of accurate yeah i mean i'm all in this is um i think in life uh you kind of part of part of maturing and figuring out who you are is orientation right uh and i'm i'm specifically talking about career orientation and you know nothing has ever given me the the level of intrinsic reward that putting all of these documentaries together have because i'm interested in the subject matter i genuinely adore the people i work with i think they're incredibly talented um you know as 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 the ceo i have to set a president you know the work ethic has to be there i expect the same from everybody in my team and they deliver and when you get all of that working in unison great things can happen and um, there's been so many pinch me moments on this journey but it's just the beginning see i don't really see what we're doing as being in the film industry i think the film industry is pretty toxic and i don't really have any interest in it or the tv industry i feel that um you know we you know i feel like it's the wild west you know <laughs> and and we we're, we're forging a new a new era of kind of direct to consumer or direct to audience relationships where you know there's nothing there's no intermediary between what you're creating and what your customer base or your audience are consuming you know it's down to you it's down to their receptiveness to your ideas and it's a new paradigm and I love it I see the full vision I understand what this sector um what it will mean in the future you know if you back one of our projects you get your name in the credits and that sounds a big deal but actually if we're creating a piece of work that by its design is supposed to be niche it's supposed to be something that represents part of your identity that's why you back a project like this you know that that's why when our products turn up on eBay they go for so much money because people don't sell them very often You know, I think that people will give these to their grandchildren. You know, it's going to end up like a family heirloom. Um and and that's that's amazing to see. It's amazing to see happen. Um and you know, uh, it, all I really want to do is keep serving our audience and keep growing it and get better at developing um an experience for our backers where they can get more involved they can get more out of it i want this to be you know the world's crazy at the moment i want it to be a really comforting distraction to get involved in the process of putting this together you know we're fans you know we're not you know we have a very flat structure in my team you know i really admire high sort of candor of of relationships and you know there's there's no divas in in my team and you know we're the same as the audience and we're going to be doing a lot more live streaming with them we want to get to know them more on a personal level as well because they are they are our peer group they're who we're serving um you know they ultimately they're the stars and us really i love i love what you've described 40 years ago if you were doing this you would have been the guy handing out cassettes going I cut this at home with my dual VHS, you know, recorders and I had a microphone plugged in in the bathroom and I did it in there or a closet. That's what you that's who you would have been 40 years ago doing this. Um so I can see that passion. You would have, you would have done this in any in any era w- with anything because I you're that guy and your team is that team that will go and they'll say you want to do this, we're going to go and we're going to do this. And it shows. Um and that's why I get excited when I see the trailers for your films. That's why I get excited when I interview you and and David and uh Jamie and Don. I get excited because I feel that creativity and I feel that passion and it's that passion that so many of us not even just in the world of horror, just in the world, you know, just in general whether it's, you know, if you like books or sports or whatever, that passion I feel like a lot of it is missing nowadays. It feels like a lot of it's just been kind of sucked out of us because I don't know if it's just too much stuff is out there. I don't know if people just don't really kind of care, but I feel the passion when I watch your films and when I talk to all of you that are associated with this. That's why I love having all of you on this show because 
um, I feel like I am talking to a peer and I feel like I am talking to a fellow fan of these movies. Um, speaking of the movies, one of the interesting things that, that occurred to me while doing this is the movie posters that you're using for uh, in your films as well as all the movie clips. Now, um, I, I'm, I don't know how complicated this is, um, but in terms of just using that, um, people probably assume, oh, you just take clips from the movies. It's out there and it's a movie. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, about what you need to do in order to get permission to use the clips and, and as well as the posters? Yeah, so it's quite a complicated legal process. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, you, you, it's quite an expensive process. We've got an incredible team. Some of the stuff that we do is, I, I would say, proprietary to what we do as a as a business. So I can't go into it too much. Sure, but but sure. essentially, um, you know, it's how do I put it? It's a complex process. It's a complex process. A complex legal process. It's a, you know, making these films is hard enough, but when you have to go through legal review, and um, which is very time consuming. Um, what I find what I find is the fun part of this is always the crowdfunding, and then we go into production, which is super fun, and then we go into post production, which is super fun. But there's this sort of chasm between the end of post production and when we are we actually begin manufacturing, and that's the most unfun part of my job. But it's also the part of my job which which is the most important, mm -hmm. and it's the sort of legal process that goes in um, that that does take weeks. Uh, to sort out but we've got a world-class team um, we work with with an amazing team um, on the legal side of things and um, it enables us to do what we do sure and, and i totally understand that i i i didn't expect anything uh, proprietary to be discussed <laughs> so I, I i can i can appreciate and understand that so thank you for answering it as as best you could with that i just wanted people out there to understand that it's not just as simple as oh we'll just pull clips from this movie and that movie because yes i wish i wish i wish i wish it was so um i love having entrepreneurs on the program um like ben scrivens who um i know you know from fright rags as well as um uh, another entrepreneur um uh, damon della greca who created the slasher horror app um, um, I had them on the program, and I love talking about what it's like being an entrepreneur and creating your own business. Um, you're you're the founder, CEO of Creator VC. You mentioned that you've done other, uh, you were with, uh, you ran other companies in the past, created other companies in the past. Um, as far as Creator VC, what was the motivation behind that? Uh, and can you talk a little bit about the company? Yeah, I can. It was a really pivotal shift in my life. So in my, my background, um, I, my degree was in TV production. I went into factual entertainment um, and it took me around the world making documentaries. Then in my sort of mid twenties, I started a business, my first media company, and we ended up growing. And I went into all sorts of kind of business areas and um, uh, enterprise technology, uh, pharmaceutical marketing, reputation management. I did so many things and I worked with huge, huge brands, um, big pharma brands. Uh, Coke was one of our biggest clients. Um, and I got to my sort of mid thirties and I was just burnt out. You know, I just, it, you know, the work I was doing had no heart. Even when we wanted it to have a heart, the process of making it meant that the heart eventually got taken out you know it was very process driven when you're creating sort of marketing and and um in videos for very precise reasons and i i i got to this point in my life where i just wanted to work on something that i cared about um and at the time i was running a business which is so far removed from what I'm doing now. It's actually funny, but I was working in technology and I was, I had a video channel, um, which was like YouTube, but it wasn't YouTube. It was its own network. And we were, we, we spent, we used video as a way to build relationships with kind of C level executives across Europe. Um, and, uh, I just sort of, at the, when, when I was running that, um, I was learning a lot about business, but I was just disenchanted with what I was doing because I'm, a, you know, at my core, I'm a creative person. I want to, I'm emotional. I want an outlet to be emotional and you can't really do that if you're talking about servers and databases, I suppose. 
Um, so at the time I was getting really into YouTube and I was discovering all these incredible creators that didn't really have any, um, you know, didn't have a brief, didn't have anyone telling them, don't do that, don't do this. They could kind of be free with their content. And I, there's a YouTube creator called Oliver Harper. Um, and I remember um, it was about 2015 or 16 when I discovered Oliver's work. And it was like a light bulb went off my head and he, he had created the most wonderful um, affection filled retrospectives on all my favorite 80s and 90s movies. And I used to have friends over on a Sunday and we watch a movie and I used to play Ollie's retrospectives afterwards. So eventually Ollie joined Patreon and as soon as Ollie joined Patreon, I signed up and I ended up building uh, a relationship with him and um, that that coincided with me exiting um that last business and one you know thinking scratch my head what do i do now and uh i just caught up with him in london he came down to see me and i said look you know i've got all this business experience you're you're, you're doing this channel i'd love to help i love it you know i don't want anything for it i just want to have a hobby that i'm into because i want to reconnect with something i care about and that was the start of all of this so i have to give oliver harper full credit because without him and the, the YouTube channel is called and it was at the it was at the Comic Con in Birmingham I was looking around going Ollie there's no real business opportunities for your channel here like I'm just looking around and I said you know what we should do you've got yeah I think you had about 100,000 subscribers at the time I said you know what we should make a documentary and we should crowdfund it um, and I said to him you know if you do this, I will set up, uh, I'll do all the business side, I'll, I'll run the whole thing. Just tell me what you want to do and we'll, we'll work with your audience to sort of fundraise it using crowdfunding. So Ollie was like, well, I'm really into 80s action movies. Let's do, do one on 80s action movies. So the next thing I know, we've all got together and he was living in Cambridge at the time. We all, I took the train up to Cambridge and we're sitting down and I came up with the name In Search of the Last Action Heroes. And that was, you know, the, the rest is history. That was our first project. Um, and uh, it was funny, I got myself a little office in London. Like, and I remember going into this office and I, I convinced my wife, I said, sweetheart, like I, I can see something here, right? I don't know what I can't, but can you just sort of back me? And she was like, look, I haven't seen you this excited about something for ages. So just like, you've got my blessing, go off and do what you need to do. And I remember the first day of being in the office working on this new project. And I just, I felt brand new. I felt born again. I thought, God, this is, I'm loving this. And it was bloody hard work making that happen. There was lots of challenges all the way through making that happen, but we, we made it. It's been a really celebrated documentary. It's on Amazon Prime. It's just been released in Germany, actually, in New Zealand as well this year, which, is, which has brought a new audience to it. But it was when I was working on that that I decided, that actually, this is for me, I love this. And so that's when I kind of went out on my own and um, started work on In Search of Darkness. I still have the notebook where I started sketching like who I wanted in it and oh, like wow. the kind of aesthetic and, you know, and it was the um, 14th of July, 2018, when I came up with the idea and I was like, that's what I'm going to do next. And the first person I called was Ben Scrivens. That's amazing. Wow. And it all comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Uh, this is this has been incredible, Robin. Uh, I, I really can't thank you enough for, for joining me here. He is projected to come out when? Okay, so um, it it's going to be ready um, in October, um, and we on our website on eightieshorrordoc.com. Um, we're saying December twenty twenty two. And we're saying December 2022 because um, that's when people will get their items shipped. So there's a whole package. There's three amazing posters, an amazing pin. Uh, there's a membership card because there's going to be a whole um, schedule of activities for backers. Um, and, and, and the big thing with this is backers are going to kind of choose, will help us, help us decide uh, what movies to feature. That's all going to kick off in November. So this campaign ends midnight Halloween. And this is a world first. No one's ever done it this way before. Um, and it, I'm, I'm excited um, because sometimes you put stuff out there and it doesn't land, but this has landed. 
and I can't wait to execute on it. That's great. And then In Search of Tomorrow is scheduled to come out... February, February. So um, that we're going to have the premiere <clears throat> in February. I can't give a date out yet, but we've decided we it's going to probably be towards the end of February um, in Hollywood. Uh, and then um, we've told everyone, all our eleven thousand backers, that we're shipping um, in April 2022 because it takes um, six to eight weeks to get all the merchandise ready because it all sure. it all needs to be created but we've got an amazing uh, supplier in california that we've worked with now on, on part two and um and part one and and uh, so we all we all know what we're doing and we're we're really excited i mean search of tomorrow is the biggest thing i've ever done it's huge we've got 75 contributors wow it's been a challenge getting it down to four and a half hours um but uh, you know, I can't wait to share it with people. It's the best work we've ever done. So maybe we'll see a part two. <laughs> Who knows? If, the, if that's what the people want, that's what we've got to do, right? That's but, what I want. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, definitely then. Okay. So, yeah. But it's been a pleasure coming on. I could, I could talk about this all day. I'm really, you know, I think in life it's very important to find something that you genuinely love. This is, I work all the time. I'm always on. But it's given uh, for me, and I, and I would extend this to the team, it's it's given us um huge intrinsic rewards like i don't know if you've ever felt like this in your life when you know you know you're doing the thing you're supposed to be doing that's how i feel and, that's it, and awesome. you know i had i have my good days and my bad days like anyone running any kind of business or any kind of job has but I'm very, very grateful to be doing what I'm doing. And I really do believe it's just the beginning. Well, we're grateful to you and your team for putting together such amazing films. Uh, they're awesome. People love them. Can't wait to see these new ones as they come out. Uh, Robin Block, he is the uh, creator uh, and producer of the In Search of Darkness films, In Search of Tomorrow, In Search of the Last Action Hero. Robin, uh, cannot wait to have you back on again down the road. Thank you so much for joining me here inside the graveyard. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for the great questions as well. And as I put this interview to rest, I would like to uh, again thank Robin for joining me on the program. It was great having him here. It was really nice meeting him. Um, now having met him uh, and having had David Weiner and the guys from Weary Pines on the program, I can see why they work so well together. A uh, really nice group of, uh, of guys and uh, knowledgeable and passionate about what they do. So cannot wait to uh, see what they put together for us for In Search of Darkness Part 3 and of course In Search of Tomorrow coming out in February of 22. Uh, I have to apologize to Robin because on his last answer, uh, there was a bit of a technical glitch on my part, so I tried to edit it as, uh, as, as best I could. Um, I didn't want to cut it out or anything. It's, it's such a great response um, about uh, how he created um, the company. So, um, so I wanted to keep it in. So uh, if it didn't seem cohesive, uh, that's on me. Um, I just worked with what I had. So apologies to Robin for that. But I didn't want to lose it because I thought it was really important stuff. Um, okay, so in the meantime, let's talk about In Search of Darkness 3. So again, um, you have the crowdfunding uh, offer which ends at midnight on Halloween, okay? So if you're listening to this in November, uh, you can still go to the website, check it out, but more than likely you probably missed out on it. But again, uh, still go to the website and here's the website it's um, I know this in my sleep it's 80s horror because I've said it enough on this program pre uh, previously uh, 80s horror doc.com that's 80s h o r r o r d o c dot com uh, 80s horror com so you go there and what do you find well let's take a look so as of right now there are over 2500 backers who have already joined this crowdfunding campaign um, so here we go. Let's talk about what you get. I'm scrolling through it right now. So with In Search of Darkness 3, and as Robin mentioned, it is coming out in December of 22. So here it is. For the first time ever, uh, they're offering backers the uh, unique opportunity to get involved in the production of the film. Uh, you can choose the movies. So uh, I'm reading off their website. Which films and topics do you want to see covered in the Part three, they're going to be surveying uh, the backers to find out exactly uh, what films you want to see, um, and then they're going to use that to uh, create the film. Uh, they're going to do quarterly live Q&As. Uh, you can join the production team for quarterly Q&As. Uh, they're going to answer questions, provide insights into the production, and uh, 
deliver first glimpses um, uh, of the documentary itself. Uh, you can submit interview questions. Um, so you can submit questions and um, they're offering backers the opportunity to submit interview questions before uh, they film any new interviews. Um, exclusive Backers Movie Club. Every month uh, you can watch a movie, uh, then meet together on Zoom to discuss a movie uh, together in a moderated discussion. Uh, then you also have uh, Unearthed Forgotten Gems. You can discover lesser known horror classics uh, that you might have missed. And then there's the In Search of Darkness membership card. Uh, display your membership card of this select group of horror superfans with pride with our membership card. We'll be using this card as a gateway to access uh, exclusive future content and deals with selected partners. Very cool. Okay, let's go through the perks. Uh, all prices are in US dollars. Uh, the standard is for $69.99. You will get the Blu-ray with the slipcase. You will get three posters, the enamel pin. You will get your name, or in my case, the Graveyard Show podcast I have on there. That um, will appear in the credits, but you will get your name, or you can select what you'd name you'd like to put in the credits. You'll get the membership card, which I just described. You'll get the digital copy of the film and a digital copy of the soundtrack. And if you want to add the Blu-rays for part one and or part two, you can certainly do that at checkout as well. Okay, moving on. The standard tier for $74.99. Uh, you'll get a DVD with the slipcase. And you'll get the rest. Posters, pin, name and credits, membership card, a digital copy of the film, and a digital copy of the soundtrack. Next, there's a trilogy bundle for $119.99. Um, you will get the uh, full trilogy, part one, part two, part three, on Blu-ray. Uh, plus, you'll get the special three-disc trilogy slipcover. The bundle also includes uh, the posters, the pin, name and credits, membership card, digital copy of the film, and digital soundtrack. Associate producer for $1,200. You will get your name in the credits as an associate producer. Uh, you will also be included on IMDb as associate producer, and you will get top supporter title on Discord. You'll also get top backer Discord channel, uh, and then all of the uh, physical and digital rewards that come in the standard package. Producer tier for 3,000 US dollars. Same thing, producer credit on IMDb, on the poster, and you will get producer credit in the credits top backer discord channel and then again all the physical and digital rewards in the standard tier and last but not least for the executive producer tier for six thousand us um same thing executive producer credit on imdb in the movie on the poster etc cetera, etc cetera, and you get all the other stuff that i just described so there you go a lot to look at and again um if this is something that interests you and you want to be a part of uh, again, you have till midnight Halloween to make this purchase. Do not miss out on this, folks. If you are fans of these movies, I know you're already there and you're doing this. But if you're just new to this, you can definitely check these movies out on Shudder. They're streaming there. Watch them and uh, see for yourself. And you can also go back and you can find all the interviews that I did with David Weiner and with Weary Pines on the Graveyard Show podcast. Um, they are here. They're available. And um, again, if you're just finding this, Go check those out. There's some great stuff on there. And uh, it's a lot of fun uh, hearing those guys talk about the process of putting together this awesome series. So uh, there you have it. 80shorrordoc.com. 80s-h-o-r-r-o-r-d-o-c.com is where you can go. Go there. Buy it. You will not be disappointed. Okay. So there you go. Um, so regarding the Graveyard Show podcast, as I mentioned at the top of the program, uh, I'm already looking ahead at the final show of the year uh, because, well, we're very close to it. So um, previous years, what I've done is normally in December, I don't do any original interviews because people are basically on vacation. And to be quite honest, I like to take some break as well. So uh, enjoy the holidays. So um, I usually, in the past, I've put together a best of podcast, and that worked fine for those times, and it, it was fine, it was good, um, but I thought this year I would change it up and do something different. So coming up in December, I'm going to have the final show of the year called Voices from the Grave. This is all original stuff you have not heard this year on any of the podcasts. These are outtakes from interviews that I've done this year. 
For example, like today, Robin Block had a great story about when he met Ben Scrivens, who was my previous guest, owner of Fright Rex, when he went to um, the Fright Rex facility. And um, I didn't include that on this because I'm saving that for the final show of the year. So I thought it would just be fun just to put together a best of, but with stuff that hasn't been heard yet. Uh, so I will have uh, outtakes from my interview with uh, Robin, as I just mentioned. I have an outtake from my interview with David Weiner that I did earlier this year. Um, I have uh, some other material as well uh, from other guests that were on the program. So uh, that will be uh, in December. It'll be the Graveyard Show podcast, Voices from the Grave. And, uh, and as I did last year, I will throw my stupidity on there with outtakes of me being a moron by myself recording the program. <laughs> because I know how popular that is. Okay, so Voices from the Grave coming soon in December. Uh, be there or be square. All right. Uh, regarding the GYS Classic uploads, I just uploaded uh, GYS Classic number four, um, which was my interview with Professor... Uh, of film studies from Seton Hall University and film critic uh, Christopher Sharrett. Uh, on that interview from 2009, we talked about uh, the subject of the other in horror movies um, and how the other relates to us. Um, Chris's uh, podcasts were always very popular back in the day uh, on my first run from 2009 and 10. Um, so it wasn't surprising to see that they were popular when I uploaded uh, this one uh, just the other week. So I know you guys like to gobble up this stuff, and I'm really happy to see that. So much so that when I upload GYS Classic number five, it will be uh, Professor Sherrett's uh, second appearance on the program, uh, where we will talk about uh, the subject of the couple in horror movies. And we're gonna talk about movies like the original Dracula, the original Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, Nosferatu. Um, we're even gonna get into um, uh, scanners and what the scanners represent in those films as well. So that'll be coming up in November. And then after that, uh, my next GYS classic will be my interview with uh, the director of Grace, Paul Soleil. Um, so that will follow as well. You don't need to subscribe to anything separately. If you're subscribed to the Graveyard Show podcast, you will see the GYS classics appear as they're uploaded. And I'm glad to see that you guys are enjoying it out there. Um, I am very proud of that first run of the show back in 9 and 10. And um, I'm really happy to uh, share these interviews with you again since they can't be found anywhere. Uh, Graveyard Show podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and everywhere podcasts exist. And the show is also available on YouTube. Just search for Graveyard Show Podcast. You can also find Catacombs of Horror, which is only available on YouTube on the Graveyard Show Podcast YouTube channel. If you know anyone who's a horror fan, please invite them to enter the graveyard. New listeners and friends are always welcome. In the meantime, my friends, uh, have a great Halloween season. Please be safe. Please be smart. Have a good time. Have fun. Um, I, it's nice to have life starting to return somewhat back to normal, depending on where you are. Um, and um, I look forward to having all of you back here again in November. And again, please, if you are interested in the In Search of Darkness uh, Part 3 offer, uh, do not hesitate, do not delay. Remember, the uh, offer expires midnight Halloween. And in the meantime, as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs>